how do you find this case of Navalny? How do you find the agenda behind Navalny's case? Well, he was a very poor recruit for uh, these Western in interests, but he was the best that they they could find, really. I mean, first of all, he's a, a, a Russian nationalist fascist, um, anti-Semite, not, not really cool, you know? Um, Secondly, he is just not very smart. If you look at his business dealings and how he got caught on the various uh, lumber stealing swindles and things like that, it, he's just not not even a, a, a high level thief. He's uh, sort of a low level um, small business embezzler sort of person. And And then the whole thing, the way it played out, uh, he never really understood what was being done to him or, or what was happening. He was just a, 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 a silly puppet. As far as his wife, who's, I don't know if she's really his wife or, or not, she, she's sort of a recruit replacement for, uh, for him and even more pathetic than he was because at least maybe 1% of the people in, in Russia could, using all kinds of social engineering, be persuaded to support him at the polls, whereas she is 0 0.0000 as far as her polling potential. So it's it's really um, she exemplifies the fact that you know this this Western sort of Orange Revolution syndicate is really scraping the bottom of the barrel after Juan Guaido, after Svetlana Tikhanovskaya was, I guess, still cooling her heels and, in Lithuania um, at public expense. After all of these failed um, stooges, you know, she, she is just the ultimate in terms of just an absolute loser. And I think at this point, what she represents is this Western attempt to at least present to themselves the idea that they still have some bearing on Russian politics, whereas they have none. They really specifically have none. And, um, you know, his his death was uh, very accurately timed. So some people thought that maybe there's some subterfuge, maybe some poison was uh, sneaked into him to for him to... to uh, die at the right moment, right before the election, et cetera. Probably not. He was a fairly sick man who um, who uh, took all sorts of substances. And um, so he didn't live long. And that's probably all the explanation that his story needs. Stoltenberg recently said that in memory of Navalny, we have to send more aids to Ukraine. He's talking about EU sending aid to Ukraine. Do you think that he is already giving up on the US and just counting on the Europeans to send more aids to Ukraine? I think this is just neurons firing and, you know, he only knows one song, which is set, send more weapons to Ukraine. So whenever he's at a loss for words, he sings his little send weapons to Ukraine song. And that's all it is. And Navalny is just something, you know, a glitch in the news. Um, not really relevant as far as Russia is concerned. I don't see what the relevance is for Europe, seeing as it just has no bearing on the situation in Russia. So this is just mouth music coming from Stoltenberg. Not unusual, but it means nothing. In a recent interview that Zelensky had with Fox News, he said that nobody cares, nobody wants Avdivka. If that was the case, why they were fighting too much, they were losing too much in Avdivka? Well, um, again, this makes perfect sense. They, they spent 10 years reinforcing Avdivka, building it into a huge uh, fortress with uh, many um, cubic meters, probably hundreds of thousands of cubic meters of reinforced concrete, basically so hardened that you couldn't possibly take it apart using artillery. Impregnable fortress. And they were defending it with uh, basically an entire, almost an entire army. Three brigades, three brigades that they just wasted on it, trying to hold it down. Of course, it doesn't matter. 
They don't care that they lost it. That's fine. You know, that that's just a song he's uh, singing to himself to, to basically, that's his little lullaby. It doesn't, again, it doesn't have anything to do with reality. The Ukraine has lost their big fortress next to Donetsk, from which they shelled civilians in Donetsk, because, you know, they're their their artillery is a little too worn out to accurately target military targets. So they shoot at civilians instead because you know if, if you shoot at an open air market or a shopping center, you're likely to at least kill somebody. You know, and that that's what they're aiming for at this point. But now they're not even aiming at that because they're too far away. They've been pushed away uh, 10 kilometers, and I guess another 10 kilometers, and they're out of range for most of their ar artillery. They might still have some longer range rockets, all Western donated stuff, you know, that they, that they, they could expend by killing civilians. But what is that going to get them? Some sense that, well, look, we're killing Russians. You know, maybe maybe that's what they need to keep their morale up, but they don't have any morale. They don't have any morale left. So again, what Zelensky said about Avdiivka is just him, so sort of soothing himself. When it comes to the casualties on the part of Ukrainian, he said something so unbelievable that they have lost thirty three thousand. This is this is nothing like what has happened in Ukraine, as CNN was pointing out, and is not anybody else CNN pointing out that this number is not realistic. When he talks this way and he thinks that people would believe in him, how do you find the state of mind of this guy? I don't think he cares. I think that there's a, a, a logic to him quoting that ridiculously low number. That ridiculously low number is the actual number of families of Ukrainian soldiers killed in action who got compensated for their loss. Everybody else was sort of missing in action or just missing, just misplaced because the, they they wanted the money for themselves. They didn't want the money to go to the families of of the soldiers. They wanted to pocket it. So that number actually represents the number of families he compensated whereas the actual losses are maybe 20 times higher, around 20 times higher, 18, 20, something in that range. Uh, as far as the public reaction in the Ukraine, well, it's a total totalitarian state. People are, are afraid to open their mouths. Of course, they're not going to say anything. Uh, most of the population is just, basically has just gone quiet, as quiet as possible. Uh, everybody who could leave has left. Everybody else is pretty much in hiding and, and not not opening their mouths. So it's impossible to figure out what public opinion is in the Ukraine. Because when, when a pollster calls up a Ukrainian, they don't know whether it's uh, the Ukrainian, um, you know, secret police trying to figure out what he's, what they're thinking, um, or if it's an actual poll. Um, they don't. They don't trust Western pollsters because they they are right to think that they're also, uh, you know, conspiring with the Ukrainian government. Uh, so you can't find out what the Ukrainians are thinking. But basically, they're just waiting for the Russian flags to appear on the streets. That's that goes for probably. Like I can't, I can't give you a number, but probably some, some, somewhere in the high seventy percent of the Ukraine of the remaining Ukrainian population, they're just really just waiting for the Russian flags to appear on on street corners, and on public buildings, and then they'll come out, you know, and weep tears of joy. Because at that point, their nightmare will be over. The Ukrainian intelligence was talking about that there are some activities in Ukraine trying to overthrow Zelensky by spring. CIA director William Burns was in Kiev and before that Victoria Nuland was there. And do you think that these conflicts within the Zelensky administration between Zeluzhny, Zelensky, all these people that are not in agreement with each other, do you think is getting out of the hand of the United States? Well, I, I think that 
um, the the controllers are actually confused. That is the the uh, uh, the Americans who uh, were supposed to be managing the Ukrainians and and telling them what to do. Um, well, to put to put it mildly, they screwed up. So they they're guilty of war crimes, which are crimes for which there is no statute of limitations and no territorial constraints. And so somebody has to go to jail for that. And and I think the Americans at this point, uh, it's it's starting to dawn on them that they're guilty, guilty, guilty. And there's going to be some infighting amongst them to figure out basically who gets to hold the bag for the Ukrainian fiasco. They're basically going to start attacking each other. So Victoria Nuland went there and uh, she wanted Zeluzhny to stay in place. Zelensky wanted Zeluzhny to go. And furthermore, Zeluzhny, it appears, just wanted his money. He wanted out. He wanted to be out of the country because when this thing falls apart, he wanted somebody else to be the fall guy, Sirsky. And Sirsky, uh, it, some people say that you know he's he's just too drunk most of the time, but he's just blindly sending soldiers to their death at this point. He doesn't have any plan whatsoever, but he's doing exactly what he's told. So he he's he's told attack the Russian defensive lines. And so he gives the order and everybody dies. And um, he says, well, we advanced three meters. What a good result. And then he gets the next order to attack and another thousand Ukrainian soldiers die. And that can keep going for as long as uh, there, there are some, uh, some artillery and some munitions on the Ukrainian side. Uh, there are they're running out of just about everything. And uh, one of the things that they're running out of is morale. So uh, the, the number of people surrendering is, is going up uh, steadily. So at some point, his orders won't really register. He, people will stop, will stop obeying him. You know, he, his nickname is already the butcher, you know, and 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 he's the great demoralizer when it comes to uh, to uh, the Ukrainian soldiers. Put him in charge, and the Ukrainians won't do a thing, or they will do as little as possible, even if they have uh, Nazis shooting at their backs, forcing them to advance. They will try to do it as slowly as possible and not go very far. And that's what we're seeing. You know, the front is slowly caving in on itself on the Ukrainian side. The Russians are in no hurry at all, but they're advancing. There are some kind of problems at the border between Ukraine and Poland. This is a country, Poland, when this conflict started, they were all in to support Ukraine. Right now, it seems that the farmers are not happy with the government's policy toward Ukraine. How do you see the changes in Poland? Well, one of the things that the Americans forced the Ukrainian government to do uh, against the wishes, the express wishes of most Ukrainians, is uh, privatize and sell public farmland. And they sold it to BlackRock, Archer Daniels, Midland, Monsanto, and the rest of uh, transnational agribusiness. And of course, what they did with that land is planted with all kinds of toxic, substandard uh, frankenfood which they then tried to flood the European Union with because the Americans told the European Union to, to drop all, all trade controls and just let this, this bad food into the European Union. And that did two things. First of all, the, the food is substandard, which caused the Europeans to become very unhappy. Um, and secondly, the farmers were being bankrupted by this, the European farmers, and and so uh, the farmer the farmer protests are just uh, they they spread throughout the EU, and uh, they the farmers they blocked the 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 border crossings and uh, they're not 
they're not letting Ukrainian grain through. And when it does get through, what they do is they dump it out on the ground and to make sure that it doesn't get to the markets. So um, basically, they're they're continuing to do this, uh, and it's it's going to basically mean that this gamble of uh, stealing the Ukraine's farmland, giving it to these transnational companies, using that land to grow toxic grain, and then flooding the European Union with that toxic grain, putting its own farmers out of business. All of that is a fiasco. All of that is just a complete and total failure. We know the performance, the operation in the Red Sea. When Russia and China see these events that are happening right now in the Red Sea, what would be the impressions for these two countries? It's it's basically like this. Um, the, these first world, supposedly first world militaries, um, the United States, uh, the United Kingdom, Israel, have been have already been defeated because they cannot put an end to any conflict. They cannot even keep it from escalating. Look at what happened in the Red Sea. Um, you know, they're shooting missiles at, at basically uh, they don't even know what. So the 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 Houthis they 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 damaged some ships. The American response was to launch rockets at uh, a Soviet era museum piece of a radar station. This was a radar station station that's supposed to spin around, you know, to, to scan the horizon. Well, apparently it hasn't been oiled in about 30 years and the antennas don't even turn. So it was strictly a museum piece. They blew it up. They expected that to somehow prevent the Houthis from finding out where the ships are so that they could no longer target their missiles. It didn't even occur to them that the Houthis are getting this information from satellite from everyone, from, from the Iranians, from the Russians, from the Chinese, from everybody who wants to share information with them, and that there are a lot of people who are perfectly willing to do that. So basically, they, they're like, they're, they're just decades behind the rest of the world. Wars against these supposedly first world um, military powers can now be they, not won, but they can be protracted um, and, and they can be escalated as needed, basically ad infinitum. How, how many days did Israel allocate to uh, uh, basically quelling Hamas in, in, in the Gaza Strip? And how many months has it been? And, and uh, Israel is, is losing its GDP at a rate of 20% per year at this point. After, after a while, it won't, there won't even be an Israel anymore because nobody can sustain such losses forever. And there is no reason to think that any of this is going to stop. So basically we're in a brave new world where um, politically people in the West, government people in the West, cannot possibly admit to themselves and each other what situation they find themselves in. And so you have these bizarre um, bizarre words being spoken. Somebody asked Joe Biden, who is basically uh, too senile to lie at this point. You know, his little lying thing in his brain is broken. So he they, they ask him, is, you're bombing. Uh, uh, you're bombing Yemen. Is that going to stop them? And he says no. Uh, and they ask him, "Are you going to continue bombing them?" And he says yes, and walks away. And and so basically, he he admitted right there and then that he's doing something completely unproductive, and he will keep doing it. So that's really where where it stands at this point. When it comes to conflict in Ukraine and then to the conflict in Gaza, we know that these countries like Brazil, China, were not in line with the policy in Ukraine. Right now, Lula is getting more vocal about what's going on in Gaza. How do you find these 
changes that are happening in the international level. These countries that are getting more and more against these kind of policies of endless wars. I think that there's a complete disconnect between uh, Israeli Jews and the rest of the world. They don't understand that the world has moved away from them, is, is sort of standing as far away from them as possible and pointing fingers. And and some truths will, will percolate through. Uh, it may be too early to speak, but you see the Israeli Jews, they're not Semites. So when they say that somebody who speaks out against Israel is an anti-Semite, uh, they're talking nonsense. They're Ashkenazi Jews. Ashkenazi, the word Ashkenazi, is a synonym for German. They're Germans. They're not Semites. The Palestinians are Semites. The Jews are not. So basically, they're a, a, a nationalist, basically at this point a totalitarian state that's perpetuating a genocide on the actual inhabitants of the land who happen to be Semites, always have been. Those people were a lot of them initially Jews, then they changed over to Christianity, then they changed over to Islam. But they're the original inhabitants of that land, and they're slaughtering them. Uh, just, just today, the, the Israelis shot up an entire crowd waiting for food because people are starving there. So uh, a, a lot of Palestinians stormed uh, a few trucks of, of humanitarian aid the Israelis felt threatened and shot shot up something like a, a thousand people, just killing hundreds of people right there, basically killing at crowds of hundred people. This is not very good optics. This doesn't play very well throughout the world. This doesn't play very well among Russia's Arab allies throughout the region. Uh, the Russians, of course. Uh, are taking this point of view that, well, we, we basically have enough on our plate, but we certainly won't, won't condone this sort of thing. Um, and what, what will end up happening is that Israel will become completely ostracized. Not even, not even the Europeans will be able to be on Israel's side because they will, say, will, they will face rebellion on their own streets. Uh, the Americans, because the, the Jewish lobby in, in the United States is so entrenched, will probably be the last country to abandon Israel. But Israel, sooner or later, will have to be abandoned because of genocide. Lavrov recently said that they are in favor of having representative from Africa, Asia, and Latin America in the UN Security Council. And it seems that the world is seeing this Security Council as something unbalanced. Well, I think the United Nations had a good run, but it has some fatal flaws. Uh, the, the biggest fatal flaw is that it is in New York, which is in the United States. And that's enough to make it unbalanced. Um, it's turning into the League of Nations 2.0. Uh, Guterres uh, recently said that basically the UN Security Council as it stands is, I don't remember the exact words, but that it is not helpful. It no longer can deal with the world's problems. Well, surprise, surprise, you know, when, when everybody wants Israel to stop killing Palestinians and, and, and Washington vetoes, you know what does that say? Well, it's it's a, it's now a useless body. So basically, the UN is kind of dead. It's it's pretty much useless. It's a it's a huge, uh, unwieldy public money sponge, dominated by Western interests, and that's not very interesting to much of the world anymore. And and so uh, the world is changing really fast. And it could turn out that some other collection of bodies, such as BRICS, or you know, BRICS is expanding rapidly, could actually form uh, an alternative 
international organization that can actually solve problems because BRICS is completely apolitical. That is part of its basically part of part of its makeup. It it is really devoted to humanitarian and economic issues. And it could actually succeed in doing that. As far as security, well, security starts when the West accepts that the Ukraine is going to have to capitulate. That I think that will be the watershed event after which uh, some discussion, some new discussion about international security can start, but not until then. Considering the conflict in Ukraine, Macron recently said that they are getting ready to send troops to Ukraine, NATO troops. <clears throat> this is the guy who was, when this conflict started, and during this conflict, everybody was seeing him as somebody who's trying to make some sort of negotiations between the West and Russia. Right now, he's getting radical. I, I Do you understand this type of behavior on the part of Macron? Um, yeah. He, he's losing power. Uh, the, he the way he lost he well lost, um, almost lost the last election. You know he he has nothing. Uh, his power base is shrinking. There there are protesters all over the place that he cannot control. He does not have public support. He does not have any international recognition as some sort of a peacemaker anymore. Um, he thought that he he had a some kind of a you know, a phone line to Putin, but then it turned out that he was leaking conversations with Putin to the press and Putin cut him off. After that, he's just basically, uh, you know, a, a voice crying in the wilderness as far as the Russians are concerned. Now, he, uh, he he's, uh, he's psychologically decompensated to the point that he uh, he listens to the sound of his own voice and likes what he hears and thinks that that's significant. So he said that, well, we might introduce some NATO troops into the Ukraine for the sake of strategic ambiguity. Now, he re I bet he really liked the sound of ambiguité stratégique. Makes no sense at all, OK? It's nonsense. But it sounds good, especially in French. So it's interesting with the reaction that this produced, which is basically everybody kind of looked at each other and did this. And it, it's wonderful when an entire group of people says, no, we're not going to fight a war with Russia. Except, of course, the Baltic states, they're ready to go. They're like basically just ready to kill themselves, each other, or whatever else just to spite Russia, because that's the only way they can keep getting paid, the people in charge in Baltic countries. Uh, even the Finns have wisened up and are quitting the military in droves. They joined NATO, but now what does that mean? You know, Finland isn't even going to have an army anymore because they don't want to fight Russia. They remember what happened the last time. You know, Finland was left without any men for a generation. All of these Finnish brides flooded out of the country and married foreigners. They don't want a repeat of that. But the Baltics are just basically too far gone to even care. But other than that, nobody wants to fight a war against Russia. And, and that's a really good result. And I suppose we should be grateful to, to Macron, you know, a man and a diacritical character. You know, a Macron is a little line over a vowel in Latin makes it longer. That's what he is. He's a diacritical character. Anthony Blinken said to Lula, Lula da Silva, the president of Brazil, that he sees no conditions for peace talks in Ukraine. Are these guys really understanding that the old days are gone and the world is changing and they have to have some sort of policy to have some sort of compromise cooperation? Do you see in their behavior? Well, uh, just reading reading the body language of various uh, U.S. officials, I, I I carefully looked at Victoria Nuland because I've been watching her for over a decade. 
she was always a crazy one, but I, I sort of looked at her face and um, her eyes looked absolutely crazy. Okay? She's, she's a maniac. But what struck me is that her eyes look sufficiently different from each other, that it, it, it is clear that the two hemispheres of her brain are thinking different things, which is frightening. And then I look at Blinken, and he says the right things. By the, by, by the right things, I mean the things that are written for him to say. But his face is crying. His eyes are the, are the eyes of a dog that knows it's going to get whipped. We have huge clashes in Tel Aviv against the government, against the Likud party and the Netanyahu administration. It doesn't seem that the Biden administration that got a lot of votes from the progressive part of the party, they're not willing to help these people who are progressives in Israel to have some sort of balance in Israel, to have a, an alternative in Israel. And they're hurting too much, but it doesn't seem that they're considering that. How do you find the situation? I, I think it's out of control. I think it's out of American control. I don't think the Americans control anything at all. Nobody gives them the time of day anymore. It's, it's a complete loss of respect. So Blinken, the reason he looks like a whipped dog is that he, he gets sent on these missions to the Middle East or this mission to the G20 to get whipped. And he knows that he's just going to get humiliated. He doesn't have the power to change the rhetoric. He has to say the words that he's been, he's been uh, not empowered, but, but that, that he's been ordered to say. He can't change the rhetoric. He can't change the music. You know, it's pre-programmed. But everybody knows really well that it's just not working. You know, it's, it's not working on every possible level. Now, as far as what Israel is going to do, you know, there are people who aren't happy with Likud, okay? Um, are they going to be friends with the Palestinians? Are they going to uh, um, change their mind and say, well, okay, you're the original inhabitants of this land, and we're just some interlopers and okay, we'll figure out where we're going in, in due time. But in the meantime, let's just all try to get along and we won't, we will stop killing you. Are, are they, are they re any of them ready to say that? And can the state of Israel survive that, that kind of a change of rhetoric, that can, kind of a, a change of public mood? Or will everybody say, oh my God, this is over, Israel is over, get me on the next plane out to anywhere, preferably Moscow. Okay? A third of the population will you know, try to fly to Moscow. That's the, the third of the Israeli population that speaks, speaks Russian, um, fully third. Um, as far as the rest, I don't know, but Israel will just empty out. So they can't really let it go without letting, letting go the, the, the the specter of the Jewish state in Palestine, uh, the the death of, of the Zionist dream of of a land for all the Jews, which is doesn't work anyway because half the Jews are in the United States. I don't think that there's any hope. I seriously do not think that the the leaders of Arab countries have the latitude to tell their own people that well. We're going to negotiate with the Israelis and we'll come come to an amicable arrangement with these genocidal freaks. And you are just going to stay home and not overthrow our government in response. I don't think that they have that ability anymore. I don't think that the armed forces of the Arab countries will stand for it. And I, all of these little insurgencies, because we're in the... In, 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 in the age of asymmetric proxy warfare, where you know Iran doesn't have to actually deploy its own troops, it can just sneak some rockets to this group or that group, and there are too many groups to count, and, and they all do their own political thing. I don't think that there is any anybody for Israel to, to make deals with who will do anything other than see to it that Israel ceases to exist.
And it can take a long time. You know, it can take a decade, but Israel will just evaporate because there's no way to make money within this arrangement. It's just unprofitable. Uh, when all these people, it's a small country, but you have all of these people pulled out of the population and sent to, to fight and to die for what? For, for basically bad reputation. Uh, because they're not really achieving security. They are achieving a very bad reputation internationally. What good will that do in the long run? I don't see uh, any any sort of reasonable end point other than Israel just hopefully gradually evaporating.